Even after Louis' failed flight to Varennes, there remained factions and politicians who truly believed that France needed a king. That his divinely ordained rule might well be the only thing propping up a compromise otherwise doomed to fail. The constitutional order that had emerged in the aftermath of the fall of the Bastille, in which the sole right of civic and national authority was vested in the National Assembly, was predicated upon three things. The consent of the people, the blessing of the king, and a robust constitution. By July 1791, these foundations were looking very shaky. Firstly, people's disillusionment with the assembly was at an all-time high, after their failures to remedy the deteriorating economic situation, deal with bread shortages, and most recently, to prevent the flight of a traitor king. And that's making no mention of the ire wrought by forcing through the deeply unpopular civil constitution of the clergy in spite of severe sectarian backlash. Politically motivated mob violence, that genie let loose from an uncorked bottle, had haunted the waking hours of the assembly's centre and right every day for two years since the storming of the Bastille. It was well established that the mob was a force to be reckoned with, and as far as the conservatives and moderates were concerned, the people had a nasty tendency to irrevocably alter the course of events in directions entirely unpredictable. The Bastille, the day of the market women, the siege of the Tuileries. Paris's mobs were only kept in check when the assembly was viewed as a friend of the people, or when the political left were getting their way. Neither of these conditions were currently being met. That second pillar, the king, like the assembly, was distrusted and despised. After his failed flight, every salacious rumour and odious insinuation peddled by the radical press took on new life. Associations with the reviled aristocracy, as well as Louis' marriage to the treasonous foreigner Marie Antoinette, were all the more reason to revile the king. And what about that third pillar, the constitution? A lot of faith was being placed in a document that was, as yet, incomplete. Ideally, it was supposed to preserve the new order, enshrine personal liberties, protect the lauded rights of man, and clearly define the limits of royal power. Well, its framers, the Constitutional Committee, had busied themselves with these specifics over several months, and as all seven of these men were members of the Friends of 1789, the end product, predictably, was likely to fall far short of expectations. In addition to ensuring property rights of the ascendant bourgeoisie, so too would the coming constitution galvanise the deeply unpopular active-passive distinction, the basis of the moderate's whole conception of citizenship. Though rights would belong to all citizens, only active citizens could participate in the political process. Everyone else? Well, just be happy you're getting anything at all. Pissed off and locked out of all decision-making, a whole nation's worth of people did not approve of the government, did not trust the king, and no longer believed the constitution would be any consolation. Put another way, France was well on its way down the road to a second revolution. A revolution within a revolution. A popular revolution. A social revolution. As dissatisfaction mounted and the people pined for change, their champions within the halls of power, the Jacobins, were at their lowest ebb in many months, unable to get much of anything past the Friends of 1789, who dominated the National Assembly. With the Friends in charge, the Assembly had instituted measures to preserve the constitutional order at all costs. It's no surprise, then, that the Assembly was now commonly viewed as a symbol of tyranny that threatened to eradicate the gains of the revolution and bring about an aristocratic resurgence. Indeed, Mayor Bailly proved to be a particularly adept prince of terror, banning public assembly, labour strikes, and most importantly, public petitions. It was the intent of the assembly in the Paris Commune to entirely prevent any chance that mob violence could influence political decisions. Additionally, they closed ranks around the king. After Louis' symbolic subjugation upon taking his oath of loyalty to the assembly and the constitution, the king's royal approval had provided much-needed legitimacy to the assembly. But with his failed flight, Louis had jeopardised the entire working relationship between himself and the Assembly, and scuppered his standing among the people. So all in all for the National Assembly, now sorely lacking the love of the people, all the stability of the Crown, and taking on an increasingly anti-revolutionary bent, rough times were ahead. But though treading rocky ground, moderates and conservatives had a fighting chance to hold back popular upheaval and shore up their shaky foundations. Taking to the fore was the triumvirate, Lamette, Barnave, and Duport, whose exceptional political careers had made them leading lights among the moderates. Under their guidance, the moderates and conservatives had struck an uneasy accord and formed a centre-right bloc, which unified the Assembly and the Paris Commune in defence of their much-beloved constitutional monarchy. Conservatives believed the king was justified in his actions and that in order for stability to return to the kingdom, 
he must be made to feel safe and secure, welcomed back into the political process to exercise at least some executive authority. Similarly, moderates sympathised with Louis but were deeply disturbed by his escape attempt. By their estimation, it had taken a great deal of time and effort to get this far, to form a constitutional monarchy and enact their legislative and political agenda. Even in spite of Louis's indiscretion, it was not worth throwing away their compromise and the peace that came with it just to punish him. This new alliance of centre and right gave room for the Friends of 1789 to advocate for the leniency promised to the royal family by Barnard on the trip back from the flight to Varan. But first, there was the small matter of just what to make of the flight itself. I mean, Louis and company had just slipped out of the most heavily guarded building in Paris, right under the assembly's nose. There was no way they'd achieve this without help. So before either the king or his supporters could let this embarrassing episode go, water under the bridge, there would first have to be a reckoning. In the immediate aftermath of the flight, the Roe family had been kept under house arrest in the Tuileries, unable to even leave to take mass at a nearby church. Security was tight, surveillance was even tighter. The last of Louis's official powers, even the ceremonial ones, were quietly stripped away. They would only be reinstated if he agreed to approve the constitution. And yet, Louis refused to be of any help to either himself or his allies. He was non-committal about support for the constitution and refused to leave the Tuileries, even on permissible little excursions to the Jardin du Roy. He'd been caught red-handed and refused to accept blame or even help. He just wanted to carry on, as though nothing had even happened. In close contact with the king since the flight, Barnav basically respected this approach, recommending Louis return to hunting and focusing on furnishing the Tuileries. Problem was that despite the fact that they were pretending nothing had happened, something had happened, and now all the chickens were coming home to roost. The entire administration of the Paris Commune, except Bailly, resigned in July. Allies were deserting the king, with good reason. To make matters worse, Louis had penned a manifesto of sorts just prior to his flight. The content of his declaration to the French people was damning. He basically made it known that he wanted the revolution reversed. Specifically, he wanted things rolled back to the compromise achieved with the Estates General of 1789, conveniently forgetting that the Estates General had failed. This was definitive proof that Louis did not support the revolution. Still, no matter how bad things got, Barnave would not abandon the king. In the carriage ride back from Varennes, the young politician came away utterly convinced of the sanctity of the monarchy. The three delegates appointed by the assembly to debrief the king after the flight, Duport, aided by an ex monachine and a guy who will show up later, François Denis Tranchet, were likewise awed by their brush with monarchy and sympathised with the king. By comparison, Petion, always more radically inclined, strengthened his ties to the Cordier Club and grew sympathetic to republicanism after the return trip. So what happened? What made Bernard commit to clandestine support for Louis? Well, Bernard had been the one to suggest the little commission head out to meet the royal escapees. His personal fondness for the royal family was well known. It seems that on the ride back, chatting with the king, talking with the queen, and playing with the Dauphin, Bernard's fondness was more than merely reinforced, but given a new impetus. Petion was sitting right next to him the entire time, and if guys like Petion had their way, the king would be put on trial. Indeed, on returning to Paris, this was exactly what Petion recommended, and Barnave would not allow that to happen if he could at all help it. But maybe Barnave was not the man for the job. He did have the backing of the Friends of 1789, but not enough sway with the people to convince them to let bygones be bygones. Really, there was only one politician who might, might, have had both the popular standing and institutional backing needed to thread the needle, as it were, and keep the monarchy intact. That man was the Comte de Mirabeau, and the Comte de Mirabeau was dead. He had died months ago, on April 2nd, heavily medicated and in the quiet of his own home. Supposedly, his last words before he passed were that with me dies the monarchy. Whether or not true, the sentiment is accurate. Mirabeau was a hero in life and a legend in death. The kingdom mourned the loss of a favourite son. Two days after Mirabeau's death, a suitably over-the-top funeral was held in the Church of Saint Eustace, in Paris. The funeral procession then embarked upon the route from the church to the recently completed Pantheon. And indeed, it was for the interment of remains of great Frenchmen that the Pantheon had been constructed. Apparently, Louis didn't mark Mirabeau's death with much more than reserved detachment. He bore a strong personal distaste for a man who, at one time, had been both a well-known libertine and a critic of the Ancien Regime. 
Yet that had not stopped Mirabeau from fighting tooth and nail in support of the monarchy. Did the magnitude of this loss occur to Louis? Who's to say? Either way, Mirabeau's death made room for Barnave to become the paragon of the royal cause. And even though Mirabeau was dead, his legacy would live on for a while until, well, certain incriminating letters came to light. So with Mirabeau out of the picture, and Barnave nowhere near as popular, the political left were able to capitalise upon the flight to Varennes. Quite unlike their conservative opponents, the Jacobins and aligned moderates did not want to rehabilitate Louis. They wanted him punished for what was, and let's be real here, a flagrant, unrepentant, and inexcusable act of treason. So while the French scrambled to shore up the king's position, left-wing propaganda promulgated a worst-case theory about why the flight had occurred. It was claimed, and accepted by the Jacobins, that Louis had intended to cross the border and flee to Austria. There he would either instigate, or at least be complicit in, a war to reinstate the Ancien Regime. And as we know, these rumours were pretty much true, though little hard evidence existed at the time. This was mostly just hearsay. But no matter how you cut it, this had been a code red. A very close call. War had only narrowly been avoided by the King's timely retrieval. Within hours of Louis' return, the left called a permanent session of the National Assembly. Precautionary measures were taken, the eastern borders were closed, Louis was placed under strict house arrest, and a state of emergency was declared. Jacobins were then the ones to strip Louis of his royal prerogatives. But the moderates couldn't quite bring themselves to fully commit, and so Louis' suspensive veto remained intact. That would prove to be a significant decision. If the king conspiring with external enemies and fleeing the capital was not enough for the friends of 1789 to abandon Louis, then nothing would. As this reality dawned on the Jacobins, they came to a realisation. That mutual cooperation, as it occurred on the civil constitution of the clergy, was at an end. The friends held all the cards. The Jacobins were all but excluded from the process of government. This constitutional order did not suit them. But another order just might. An order ushered in by a republic. Editors of radical newspapers in the court IE took the king's failed flight as all the permission they needed to start pumping out all sorts of republican propaganda. Even before the flight, Marat's L'Ami du Pop and Hébert Pierre Duchamp, as well as all manner of pamphleteers, orators and cartoonists, had floated democratic republicanism for a while. Getting rid of the king, replacing him with a president, and founding a democratic republic along American lines was now becoming an increasingly popular idea. Originally, such a notion sprouted from the minds of the most hot-headed and full-throated revolutionaries in the Courrayi, but did not become the official platform of the Courrayi Club until Danton began his flirtations with republicanism earlier in the year. Though a convinced monarchist, he had concluded earlier than most on the left that the king was unreliable, and accurately predicted his escape attempt. Thus, when he was proven right in June, Danton publicly sang the praises of republicanism and democracy to his adoring followers. And as the Courrayi gained more and more popular support in the turbulence caused by the flight to Varennes, their niche idea became a mainstream concept. It was not long before many Jacobins like Robespierre came around to the idea of a republic. As propaganda worked its magic, public and intellectual opinion was weaponized and targeted squarely on the king. If punishing him for his betrayal was not possible, it was necessary to overthrow him, by force if needed, and replace the constitutional order. Republicanism had arrived, and entered the bloodstream of French radical politics. Conservative reaction to the rise of unabashed republicanism resulted in a renewed bout of vitriolic clashes between a newly redefined left and right. Within the assembly, the ascendant right had the upper hand. Due to having a plurality of established and influential delegates, the Friends, more often than not, managed to temper the radicals' punitive or antagonistic proposals. One such proposal was issued by the Jacobins. It would officially recognise that the constitution was incompatible with monarchy, a nakedly republican and thus unconscionable decree. No way the Jacobins would have dared to put this on the floor without very good reasons. After all, most of their members were still avowed monarchists. As it had transpired, Danton had leveraged his influence to convince leading light Jacobins such as Robespierre to push the proposal. It was shameless political theatre never intended to sway right-wing delegates, but instead to rally the people to the Jacobin and Courtier cause, when the Friends and the Augustinians inevitably publicly repudiated republicanism. In the meantime, an investigation had been opened into just how the king managed to escape. Since punishing the king was not an option politically, the assembly went after his aiders and abettors. 
a warrant was put out for the arrest of Axel von Fersen, but the Count had fled the country. So looking elsewhere, Dupont worked tirelessly to secure a falsified confession from Bouilly, claiming that the general had abducted the king. The confession suited both left and right. Under this arrangement, Louis still had egg in his face, which was fined by the Jacobins, and the friends could argue that the king was under duress and not fully responsible for the flight. In exchange for this generous turning of the other cheek, the National Assembly expected Louis to grant his royal approval for the under-construction constitution. Do this, they said, and all your pals will remain intact, your royal person inviolable, and your throne secure. But here's the problem. The Assembly didn't release the conditions of this deal publicly, likely waiting for the upcoming Fête de la Federes to make the announcement. So those that wanted the king punished, and those who wanted him protected, were left equally adrift. The fires of resentment against the Assembly were stoked. In this artificially created information vacuum, the Jacobins were in their element, and carefully cultivated the public's severe dissent and dissatisfaction. Demands that the king be tried and punished grew louder and clearer. Smelling blood in the water, and furious that the king should be let off so lightly, Danton and the Courtier Assembly planned some more political pantomime. In response to the vacillating assembly, they wrote a petition, intended not merely to put across their demands, but also to fill that information vacuum with an official sounding proclamation that was agreeable to the people. Now the petition itself was written by someone new, someone who will very soon loom large in the revolutionary picture, a 37 year old clerk turned propagandist, Jacques-Pierre Brissot. Born into an unassuming middle class family in Chartres, his father was a successful innkeeper and minor landowner, and his mother nowhere to be seen. Living a lonely but fairly quiet life, the young Brissot attained a good education afforded by his father's success. When he came of age, he trained as a clerk to a law firm, eventually moving to Paris itself to further his education. So thrust into the churning mill of French radical politics, Brissot found himself indelibly marked by the works and writings of the great philosophes. Somewhat naively, he fancied himself quite the writer, and though not an exemplary lawyer, Brissot believed he had the makings of a great novelist. As luck would have it, it was here that Brissot found his better half, the equally naive Félicité Dupont, and with her began his literary career. Once married, they emigrated to London, settling down as a writing duo, with Brissot penning the tracts and Dupont translating the research material from English to French. Brissot had not forgotten his roots in the legal profession. He wrote prodigiously on the ethics of law and moral precept, with a distinctly Rousseauist interpretation. His writings led to the conclusion that penal and judicial reform were absolute musts in his native France. These thoughts he put to paper in one of his earliest and most influential pamphlets, Théorie de les criminels. Underpinning much of Brissot's early works was the idea that all law had a natural place in society, and that for law to function properly, it had to be rooted in sound morals and ethics, a theory with its origins in natural law. In this vein, and further annoying the French judiciary, Brissot published Philosophique du Législateur, bringing into question the moral authority of judges. Despite a strong start, Brissot's other undertakings were miserable and expensive failures. Penniless by 1784, Dupont and Brissot returned to Paris, at which point Brissot was promptly arrested and detained in the Bastille, all on false charges of having produced pornography of the Queen. Despite what the authorities might have wanted, Brissot's few months in the Bastille had a radicalising effect. He entered as a mere dissident and left as a revolutionary. Here is where we see Brissot as the no-holds-barred master propagandist come to the fore. No target was too big or off limits. The French judiciary, faux intellectuals, the Catholic Church, the Emperor of Austria. He chopped them all to pieces with a hailstorm of venomous pamphlets. Naturally, of course, Brissot made powerful enemies, and so was forced to divide his time between Paris and London when things got too hot at home. With his unapologetically moralistic outlook, it was perhaps only natural that Brissot found a common cause with prominent abolitionist William Wilberforce in their moral and intellectual crusade to abolish slavery. It was in this capacity that he returned to Paris in time for the Estates General, and sensing an opportunity, essentially began the French abolitionist movement as a founding member of the Society of the Friends of the Blacks. He also became one of the big pro-revolutionary propagandists when he was made editor-in-chief of the Patriot Francais. That same year he travelled to America, ostensibly to spread the good word of abolitionism, but no doubt also to examine some of the young republic's novel political institutions, Congress, the Supreme Court, the House of Representatives, all that good stuff. And it must have made a profound impression on him because, by 1791, Brissot had returned to France and co-founded a new newspaper called Les Républicains, 
championing the cause of republicanism in France openly and proudly. The Republican was his own platform, and it gave Rousseau room not only to push for his own republicanism, but also his moral-centric ideas for reform and revolution. With his considerable expertise, Brissot had no trouble in crafting a petition against the monarchy. It was a clear and unambiguous denunciation of the king, recommending a trial to determine what punishment was applicable for his treason. Again, leaning into that very Rousseauist conception of the general will, Brissot's petition made it plain that the trust between the king and the people was utterly destroyed. There could be no compromise now, and all the deputies, meaning members of the assembly who yet supported Louis, were encouraged to think likewise. Even should Louis or his supporters attempt to make amends, nothing short of a trial would do. Only in the case of overwhelming popular support, stated the petition, should Louis be permitted to keep his crown. Otherwise, a successor should be chosen in the quote, constitutional manner. That last bit was probably meant to be as vague as it sounds. Would it mean forcing Louis' abdication, thus that the Dauphin became Louis the Seventeenth? Did it signal that Brissot hoped the succession would be bogged down in conflicting claims? Perhaps he meant the assembly, framers of the constitution, should arbitrate, potentially meaning that the Jacobins could derail the succession. As the petition was sent around the courtier from person to person, Lafayette had his National Guard do all they could to prevent as many people as possible from signing. Dispersing crowds, breaking up meetings, arresting leaders and cracking a few skulls. All in a day's work for the Guardsmen. Basic liberties enshrined in the rights of men were being trampled. If you criticised the government's generosity to the King, or stated that he had not been kidnapped and had escaped of his own free will, you'd quickly find yourself arrested by the Guard on falsified charges of disturbing the peace or spreading sedition, and spend some time rotting in a mouldy prison. Of course, this all went down a treat with the radical press, and out of this period, we see some of the most antagonistic and incisive left-wing propaganda thus far put to print. That propaganda war between the left, centre and, to a lesser extent, the right, was in full swing by 1791. Although Marat and Hébert had very successfully opened up a revolutionary front with their newspapers and propaganda, the centre and even the right wing were not idle, and they developed their own propaganda networks, which were, admittedly, less successful, but no less partisan. This propaganda war was coming to a head. As debates in the assembly became more and more factional, the French returned heavy blows at the left throughout June and July. In the climate of political upheaval propelled by the propaganda war, it was becoming more and more difficult to outright defend the king. That was a one-way ticket to a knife in the back, or an equally as murderous character assassination printed in the next day's paper. So conservative or moderate propaganda utilised more indirect methods, projecting blame on the people and away from the king. One of their more sensationalist pamphlets, Le Bebeliard, sent shockwaves throughout Paris in its July 6th edition. Put to print was a crude repudiation of the left, which pinned the blame for economic woes, government crackdowns and political crises squarely on the shoulders of the disenfranchised people. The multitudes of unemployed, poor and starving who Le Bebeliard falsely claimed were in the pay of quote, sedition mongers. The National Guard and the bourgeoisie, it was claimed, were aghast at their antics. As a final call to action, the pamphlet stated that the mobs ought to be cleared away by cannon shot. The language of political violence, unambiguous and explicit, had an immediate and predictable effect. It really, really pissed off Paris. Spontaneously, the saint rioted, organised by radicals and republicans. The Commune and the National Guard managed to clamp down on the worst of it, but within the Courtier Assembly, the rising of the saint was looking like an opportunity to make some hay while the political sun was shining. Such provocations could not go unanswered. The moderates had taken their swing and missed, opening themselves up to a counterblow. That counterblow fell a fortnight later, on a Sunday, about two weeks after Louis' retrieval. Since Le Babeliard's peace on July 6th, the Courtier Assembly had orchestrated a mass demonstration for July 17th, three days after that most sacred date for the revolution, but also smack bang in the middle of this year's obligatory Fête de la Federes. Somewhat neutered celebrations had been planned by the Commune. Unlike last year's bombastic and incredible display, there was only a relatively small public gathering in the Champ de Mars that excluded non-Parisians. And besides that, not much else. There was a lot more excitement for the Courtayis demonstration. Word had electrified Paris, and it wasn't long before the false rumour had spread that the day's events would witness the proclamation of a republic. Given the scale of the rumour, it was impossible to keep any of this secret from the Paris Commune. But by the time they knew, Bailly and the Commune could do little more than react to events as they unfolded, issuing a belated order to impose martial law late on the night of the 16th. The next morning, 
a massive group of tens of thousands surged towards the Champ de Mars. But finding the way barred by National Guardsmen, they melted away. They were, however, only the first wave. Later in the day, mobilized and well organized, the saint rose, almost as one, and descended upon the Champ de Mars. Their intention was to disrupt the fate, co-opting the kingdom's most sacred day for their own mass demonstration. So tens of thousands of saint massed on the Champ de Mars in defiance of the martial law order, and here representatives of the Courtier Club, chiefly Marat and Danton, as well as Jacobin and left-leaning moderate allies like Robespierre and Brissot, made electrifying speeches and recited revolutionary literature. At the centre of this demonstration was both literally and figuratively Brissot's petition. Having outlined the idea that the king's replacement should be determined by popular vote, Brissot opened the avenue for Danton or Desmoulins to advocate an even bolder stance. An addendum was added to the petition, demanding not merely that Louis' successor be chosen by election, but that Louis ought to abdicate forthwith. While a step short of the rumoured declaration of a republic, it was clear that the demonstrators and the organisers were certainly on a republican trajectory. The petition must have been a pretty big roll of parchment, because it had already attracted hundreds of hastily scribbled signatures from the assembled saint culot who clustered around the altar of the fatherland from the previous year's Fête de la Federes. By day's end, there were over 6,000 signatures. Mostly it was a collection of scrawled initials and illegible names, but was nonetheless presided over by the Cordiguese leaders, who guarded their precious petition. And good thing too, because it wasn't long before the National Guard was dispatched to crush the demonstration. When Mayor Bailly was informed of the raucous Republicans who had occupied the Champ de Mars, he did not hesitate, ordering an immediate crackdown. That greatest fear of the centre and right was now being realised only a short distance away from the Tuileries and the Menage. To allow the mob to once again derail their project was not an option, and so every means available would be deployed to end the demonstration before it snowballed out into citywide violence. At once, Bailly called up the National Guard. Lafayette was commanded to take the guard and disperse the crowd, by whatever means necessary. But the saint culot are a different breed from the regular, disorganised, headless mob. The Marquis had already been dealt a defeat by them back at the Vincennes in April. He knew it was a vain hope that they would be dispersed peacefully. As the National Guard was marching on the Champ de Mars, a shimmer of uproar rippled from the crowd. Beneath the altar, four men, a hairdresser, two peasants and an invalid, had hidden themselves beneath the stairs. The consensus is that they were either perverts or looking to snag some dropped valuables. No matter why, Others in the crowd presupposed that they were counter-revolutionaries, there to set the altar alight. One by one, they were dragged from hiding, taken to the nearest lamppost, and strung up by their necks. A little while later, a red flag appeared above the streets near the south side of the Champ de Mars. The National Guardsmen had arrived. They were greeted as befitted lackeys of the assembly and the king. At first, with insults and ridicule. Before long, verbal missiles gave way to real ones. Rocks and loose cobbles hurled with unerring precision. The Marquis de Lafayette demanded that the crowd disperse, as martial law was in effect. But no good. The saint held fast. In response, Lafayette ordered shots fired above their heads. Whizzing bullets made a much more compelling argument to disperse, but after a short while, the saint regained their composure and resumed their own fusillade of verbal and physical projectiles. They then circled about to envelop the interlopers. Guardsmen were now flanked by the mob, hemmed in and attacked mercilessly, their formation barely holding. What exactly happened next, no one knows. Sensationalist left-wing propaganda later claimed that Lafayette ordered a volley fired into the crowd, others that soldiers fired of their own volition. What seems most likely is that some unknown guardsman lost his cool and fired into the crowd, setting off a chain reaction of sporadic firing from along the line. The end result was horrific. All tallied, some 50 bodies lay shattered and broken on the cobbles. The Champ de Mars ran red with blood. Whatever trust, whatever love that lingered between the saint culot and the National Assembly died with those 50 Parisians on the Champ de Mars. It's impossible to understate just how profound the break was. Politically activated urban peasants and Republican revolutionaries on one side, bourgeois constitutionalists and uncompromising monarchists on the other. The moderates were no longer projecting the revolution, they were ending it. Now. Middle class delegates, overwhelmingly moderate in temperament and politics, were sated with what they had gained property and voting rights, constitutional monarchy, and enlightened reform. Was it not enough? Who were these peasants to demand more? Love lost between the commons and the assembly saw the political fortunes of several delegates plummet 
never to recover. They, like Meunier, retired to the countryside. The Abbé Sieyès, a true revolutionary, let's not forget, could not stomach the talk of a republic, viciously biting back at the idea, for which he lost all standing among the people. Several others were fatally discredited and followed suit. But none suffered quite like Lafayette. For his part in the massacre of the Champ de Mars, as it came to be known, the Marquis secured for himself the undying enmity of the saint Marat's paper quite literally demanded that the Marquis be put to death. And it was not just the people who now hated him. The Marquis de Lafayette, too radical for the moderates, too moderate for the radicals, was spurned by former associates and friends, forced to navigate future political perils on his own. In the next few weeks, Jérôme Petion was elected mayor of Paris after Bailly retired. Sympathetic to the Republican cause, Petion was expected to be far more accommodating of the left than Bailly ever was. His actions proved otherwise. Under Petion, reactionary backlash to the saint was just as vicious. Brutal reprisals witnessed the near-total muzzling of the radical press, the arrest of popular leaders, and the suppression of the Jacobin and Courtier clubs. Martial law remained in effect the entire time, limiting anyone's ability to travel or gather freely. Santé and Demoline were hunted by Paris police, but sought refuge in the Courtier, and only narrowly escaped imprisonment. Danton fled to England, Brissot fled to Holland. The leadership of the Courtier club, to a man, went into hiding. They would only return with a general amnesty proclaimed at the tail end of 1791. In short order, the moderate's power grab and reaction return in the immediate aftermath of the massacre of the Champ de Mars would backfire, and spectacularly so. As we've seen, political fortunes will rise and fall with such frequency and unpredictability that it's safe for us to say that the moderates could not hold power for very long. But more than mere political fortune was now at stake after the massacre. Remember, the people were now organized and energized. The saint were always waiting in the wings, ready at a moment's notice to pick up the tricolor. They would get their chance soon enough.